Hello, amateurs. Welcome to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host, Tim, and I've got another fantastic guest for you today. This man represented England at under 20s. He was a premiership star for Harlequins and Worcester, and I once gave him a try scoring pass whilst playing for Blackheath second 15. Please welcome Mr. Sam Smith. Sam, how are you? I'm good, thanks. I think you've done yourself a disservice then, because it was probably in the uh, first 15, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it actually wasn't. It was when you came on loan, obviously from the team, and, you know, everybody yeah. had to play in the second team to get going. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of those weird, random rugby memories that I, I do remember. Do, do you remember it, Sam, at all? <laughs> I don't, to be honest, Tim, but I'm really glad that you do. At least one of us does. <laughs> but I, do, I do remember that I do remember that game yeah <laughs> I think it was Newbury away that's my vague recollection anyway yeah. um obviously retired now Sam I was just wondering like some people retire from rugby and then you know go away from it completely but are you still are you still like a fan of the game now like did you watch the recent Six Nations and stuff yeah so I've got a four-year-old and three-year-old uh sons so whether I watched it is a loop is probably like a loose term. Um, I was in the room when it was on TV. Um, but yeah, no, I, there were a couple of the evening pictures I watched, but I, I really enjoyed it. It was nice to, nice to see a team build and kind of see what can happen when people start to click and gel together for sure. Yeah, it was, uh, it was quite a transition throughout the tournament for England. Mm -hmm. That's sure. Now let's get to you. How did you get started in the game? What were your sort of early steps? You know, how did you get going? So, so I, I came from a pretty sporty family. So my mum rode for Great Britain and my dad played rugby for England and also for Wasps and he was also a winger. So I had that kind of, yeah, sporting background and I'm really grateful that I didn't have pushy parents. So they never said you need to be a rower or a rugby player. And I think I did what some kids do and is think, oh, well, if my parents like those things, they must be rubbish. So I tried every other sport under the sun, <laughs> um, all the way from like skateboarding, karate, football, every like everything. And I was crap at them all, but I was really, 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 really um, like super competitive. And so I was really unhappy that I was crap at all these sports. And then I eventually gave in when I was about 12, I tried rowing, realized it was way too hard. And then at 13, I picked up a rugby ball and never really looked back. Like it was very quick from, I started at Guildford and Godalming. Um, and within, yeah, within a season, I think I was in the Surrey team. And the year after that picked up in the Harlequins Academy. And then the year after that for England under 16. So it all, it all kind of happened very quickly. And yeah, but it was, it was awesome fun. That is rapid. Yeah. And a relatively late start, you know, um, some people go way earlier, some a bit later, but how did you find those sort of early days of playing? Like you must've had a, like a background obviously with your dad and his mm. experience, but did you, is that one of the reasons you think maybe why you picked it up quite quickly? I think, pro yeah, probably I, I always, I mean, I always grew up with a rugby on in the, in the house. I, I used to love watching the, I think it might have even been the five, yeah, anyway, the six nations of dad and, I remember waking up at six in the morning to watch England, New Zealand fixtures as a kid. So I'd always been on my radar and I just, I, I went to a school that played football. So I didn't, it just, just just never really happened. And then, yeah, when it did it, like, yeah, it just really kind of all clicked. And I remember my first game, I played the first half at seven and the second half at 13. And I much preferred the second half. <laughs> and I never looked back from kind of being back from that kind of that day on. Yeah, I think it is definitely possible to pick up a lot of information via sort of osmosis, just mm -hmm. being around it. Um, so then when you actually get on the pitch, you know, you, you kind of do know what you're supposed to be doing as opposed to somebody that's never seen it before. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I, I think I just had, yeah, I guess an understanding of what, what m makes a good rugby match and sort of what people, are, I guess what people are trying to do in, in a sport that if you watch it for the first time, it can be quite confusing. So interestingly, like as it wasn't a passion or maybe an anti-passion, as you described, what was it like when you then started progressing and, and you know, getting picked up by Quinns and things like that? It felt, it, it's really weird, like reflecting on it now, it, it, it was like a dream that was coming true that I hadn't known was a dream until it was happening. <laughs> I think 
I'd always wanted to be a professional athlete in whatever sport it was. And so suddenly a couple, two, three years into this rugby stuff to be in the mix for, yeah, England age group and playing. I can remember the first game against Wales. I was, I was going to be 15 years old, which seems so young now, but like it was amazing. And yeah, it, it it hadn't been a passion or or a thing, but it very quickly became the only thing I really cared about. Absolutely. So, playing for England, obviously a huge, uh, huge honour, massive excitement. Now, you wrote something on LinkedIn a little while ago, which I'd like to dig into because this comes into like coach feedback. And one of the England coaches at the time kind of said something along the lines of, "You're not tough enough. You need to toughen up a little bit." What? How did that affect you? And you know, can you see where he was coming from or, or do you still sort of hold some resentment or anything about that? So I think like the, the toughen up feedback is for me just, it's horrendous feedback because what does that actually mean? And, and also it, it, it wasn't, you're not, you're not being physical enough in tackles or at rucking or at ball carrying that what something that you could actually tangibly work on to get better. It felt like it was a general flaw in my character. And as a 16 year old kid at that point, you look at an England coach and you're like, you're, you're kind of God and you're, my fate rests in your hands. And I had no concept that these coaches are also humans and they have flaws and they're not perfect. So they literally, I took that piece of information and believed it to be completely true. And yeah, it affected my, it affected me like probably mostly subconsciously, but for the rest of my rugby career. And like, I kind of, I, I agree that there was loads of room and there always was, it was a massive work on for my whole career was to be more physical in contact in defense. So that was always something that didn't come naturally to me. And there was a real disconnect between my physicality as a, as an attacker versus my physicality in the defense. What it was, a, it was a big strength of mine with the ball in hand. And it was a big weakness of mine, not when I was in defense. So I like, I, I looking back, I agree with him, <laughs> but just the way it was delivered to a young lad was 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 not good, and I think that that uh, it, and I no sorry you go no carry on. yeah I was gonna just yeah to say that I think that that kind of feedback is is rife in the game all the way through from young lads to professional kind of in the Premiership is there is there's room for improvement I'd say of a lot of coaches and how they're how they're helping players develop and grow and get better. Yeah, I think there has been, um, there's been a big change in coaching, I think, in terms of attitudes and the way people go about it. I think, you know, the days of, uh, I guess, Eddie Jones is a classic example, you know, the sort of dictator type. Um, I think they're fading away slightly, but you still think it's mm. definitely a factor in the pro game. I can't comment for the last, yeah, for the last seven years. I mean, I've been out of it seven years now, but I've seen, I've seen it like hundreds, hundreds of times, stuff like that happening. Not like mine was one to one, but I've seen worse stuff than that said in the group setting in front of 50 peers. So I hope that it's dying out and I'm sure it is because as younger coaches come in who have been in this professional environment, I'm sure they're bringing their own learnings and experiences into, into this place. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the next stage, I guess, of the career of a young aspiring premiership star is to then go out on loan at, at various clubs. And I met you first at Blackheath and then later at Isha as well. What was that like for you? Is it something that you really relished doing or was it something you felt was necessary or or how did how did it work out for you? Yeah, I remember being really excited for both Blackheath in my first year and, and Isha because there was no way I was playing at Quinn's, but they both of these um, clubs gave me an opportunity to, to yeah, eventually start every week for a couple of seasons and actually get the experience of what it's like to show up week after week in a team and see a team gel and grow and learn together. And also it's a growing up environment to be around kind of grown men when effectively we were kind of still kids pretending that we were men. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Now, we had, at both clubs, we had players from Quinns and from Wasps, and I think maybe one other club as well. I can't remember the exact details. But was there, what I want to know, was there any rivalry between you guys 
from other premiership clubs, you know, whilst in that environment? Or was it all, were you all kind of doing the same thing? So you're kind of getting along with it? I think we all got on pretty well. I think it was nice to, it was nice to meet guys doing the same thing at the same level in another environment and hear, hear their stories of what it was like and connect, connect with them. So I think it was a, yeah, I, rem- I, I really look back on both of those experiences with like really fond memories. Um, think of amazing bus trips and train trips back from up north. And but I, I guess for me, it gave me a taste of, of an older generation of rugby kind of environment where it was the more kind of amateur ages where it was like you train twice a week, you play at the weekend, you give it everything. And on the way home, you have a really good time with your mates. And that was really special. Yeah, because had you experienced anything like that at all up to that point, or was that completely new for you? No, <laughs> like, yeah, like school rugby for me was was just it was just school rugby, and then all of a sudden, yeah, you're on a you're on the back of a bus, and someone's drinking a whole bottle of port in an hour, and thinking, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> Yeah, that kind of thing does happen. Um, Now, I always ask the positive questions around uh, this experience, but was there was there any negatives for you in terms of being a lone player? Was there any things that could have been better in your your experience? Honestly, no. I think I was like super lucky to have. I mean, Blackie, if we had Harvey Biljong and Mike Friday, so like both incredible coaches and to learn off them was, was really valuable for me. And same with like Mike Schmidt at Isha, like Isha legend for a reason Like he, he's been a part of something great at that club. And it's, yeah, for me at both places, I felt super welcomed by all of the other players. I I think there was a, there was a bit of trepidation coming into a group that there might not be a welcome because we were kind of the academy lads coming, kind of being shipped in and, but I guess with those kind of scenarios, you make you make it what it is. Like, and I believe like me and the other guys kind of went in and actually cared about Isha and Blackheath as well. So we weren't just kind of coming in like mercenaries. I think we came in and gave everything. And I think with time, that respect was then kind of given back. I completely agree. And I would say that, like you say, yourself and also all the other lone players that I played with, I think everybody really bought in to the idea and the system. And it's interesting what you said there about some trepidation about the first weeks coming in. Like the start Mm. of pre-season, like as a player group, we'd often be like conversations about which loan players we were going to get and Mm. how it was going to stack in our team. So it was actually kind of the other way around. It was we're excited to see Mm. who was going to come, what they could contribute. That's really cool. Like it's it's funny because I've never I've never thought of it like that. And yeah, that's yeah. I bet there's loads of well, there's loads of positives of bringing these guys in and yeah I remember my first drive around the M25 I used to live in Kingston so I literally had to basically do 50% of the M25 three times a week um (laughs) to get across to Blackheath and I remember doing it I was living with Yorkie at the time and yeah we both yeah were driving across and had no idea what to expect but yeah it was cool yeah, amazing. So obviously you went really well at Blackheath and then Isha uh, higher up than that, uh, which got you into recognition for the Quinn's first team. And, and you know, for a long time there, you were a regular starter on the left wing. What was it like turning out at the stoop and, and you know, wearing that jersey? Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Um, again, it's like when I was probably 15, 16, on the verge of signing my academy contract, there was just this holy grail of playing in the premiership and that was everything was kind of geared towards that for me and yeah to get to do that on a number of occasions and yeah be a part of a team that won it as well was just yeah it was brilliant it was like it it was everything I'd hoped it would be in that respect in terms of those game moments and being a part of a team like that and it all seems like it all seems fairly plain sailing to me, the story so far, were there any like road bumps in the way? Were there any times where you maybe struggled or, or started to, you know, feel like it might be a bit too difficult? Yeah. So like I've spoken about this quite openly before, like when I was at, when I was at Quinn's, I did suffer quite badly with um, depression at times, um, particularly I think when I was 20, when I was 22, 
I was always, I always really struggled to be consistent. So I would come in for a bout of games and then I would have an absolute shocker, get dropped, have to spend a lot of time getting back in the team. And I wasn't ever able really to break that cycle. So it felt like a real up and down journey for me. And I think, yeah, I did, I did struggle a lot and had some counseling through the RPA when I was 22. Um, so yeah, I think, and I think like with the work I do now, this, these stories are not uncommon in athletes, like from the outside, there's this shiny veneer of success and performance, but actually the experience internally off away from training or yeah, at home can be a lot different. Yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, there, there is a big difference, isn't there between starting on the wing on a Saturday and being outside of the 23 like the, the, that's a stark contrast. Yeah. So um, just a, a bit about the RPA, because they sometimes get a bit of a mixed press, but they you obviously feel like they really helped you during that period. Yeah, so Ben McGregor was my um, player development manager at Quinn's at the time, and he was faultless. Like I've still, I still speak to him now, just kind of catching up every now and again. And it's like a really, really good guy. And yeah, he he was someone I felt I could go and open up to at a time when I wasn't able to open up to anyone. And yeah, it wasn't something I, something I still struggled with like for the rest of my career and post rugby, but yeah, to have, have him there was, was super important at that point. Was, yeah. What was the, was the reason why you couldn't open up? Was it anything to do with obviously rugby's got this macho atmosphere yeah. and it it was more so back then in the days that you're talking about than it probably is now. Was was that a factor in it or do you think it was more internal to yourself? I think a mi- mixture of both, but but if I'm honest, it'd be, it, it was my stuff. I, I wasn't able or didn't believe I could ask for help. And I felt that was a like a sign of weakness. And yeah, for and I was in a lot of pain and I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't really able to do much with it. I hadn't learned those skills growing up and I was very much in the mold of just push it away, ignore it and keep striving forwards. But I mean, there's only so, there's only so long you can keep doing that. And and how are you now? Like you sound like you've, you've kind of understood all those things and those feelings and, and you've managed to work on it. Did you say you're clear of those things now or, or do they still come back every now and again? I don't think this stuff ever be clear of it, but yeah, I'm, I'm in a good place now. I've done a lot of inner work, um, particularly since I retired. Like when I retired at 26, um, my whole world collapsed from underneath my feet and it was fucking horrendous. I kind of two years, well, almost straight away really was, I built a business and I was either working drunk or high on drugs because I couldn't cope with how I was feeling. I just had to numb myself and it was a super, it was a really tricky time. And it was, it was a a guy, he was a customer at my coffee shop. who's a life coach who put his hand on my shoulder one day and said, should we go for a coffee? Because I think he'd seen the decline of me over that two year period since I'd retired because he kind of came in every day for his coffee. And I kind of did what I usually did, which was kind of shrug it off and go, no, no, I'm fine. He's like, no, let's go for a coffee, Sam. And thankfully I did. And he coached me and it kind of changed my life. Wow. Um, Like how, what, what, what were the conversations? What, how did it manifest? What, What happened? So my, I would say that my, all of my self-worth was wrapped up in my identity as a rugby player. So I believe at that point in my life, I believed that I was only a good human if I was playing well at, in rugby. And it's why looking back, I could never consistently perform because the games were life or death for me, because if I played badly, it was actually like a, it was proof. It was more proof that I was a shit person. So I was heaping that much pressure on every time I played. And so no wonder I couldn't maintain that. And then I get injured and I have my rugby player, like uniform for want of a better phrase or identity kind of taken away from me. I literally, and I didn't know this at the time because I had not a lot of self-reflection or sort of self-awareness, but 
I was effectively stripped of everything that I believed was good about me and all that was left was me. And at that point in my life, I didn't believe that was enough. So what I did was I built a coffee business and I kept growing and growing and growing it because eventually I thought, well, I'll become a really good entrepreneur and then society will think I'm worthy again. So I kind of took, the, I lost the rugby player identity and I grabbed as onto the nearest one I could find, which was to become an entrepreneur. And I went all in on trying to be successful externally to make up for how I felt internally. And yeah, the result was a total car crash. <laughs> to um, me, yeah. yeah um, I mean, coffee culture within rugby is, is rife, isn't it? They're like everybody loves a, a sappuccino and all mm. of that kind of stuff going on. You obviously then took that into into the work so like did the business go well like just as an aside like did it was it a success yeah so I had loads of success we I opened one in Worcester like just after I retired and then another one in Birmingham and then we opened one in Bristol and then we opened up a wholesale coffee roasters um to kind of roast our own coffee and then also to build a wholesale business servicing other cafes and restaurants and stuff and then, yeah, it, it was going really well. And then COVID happened and kind of the hospitality industry just fell flat on its face. And it was a really tough few years and got to the point like, well, it got to the point where I, a couple, maybe two or three years ago, I realized actually I didn't really enjoy it. And I'd built this business for all the wrong reasons. I'd built it to fill a void. And then because I'd kind of done the work, I no longer had the void. And then I realized, well, why am I doing this? And so then I was like really searching for what, what is my purpose in life? What do I want to do? Because it's not this. And and coaching was the thing that I eventually kind of stumbled across. And with the coffee business, did everything we could to keep it going. But in May last year, I sold the original one. And then in November last year, I had to liquidate what was kind of left because of basically the hangover from COVID. And that was my kind of forced me to step into coaching full time. But here we are in what March and I'm pretty happy about that decision. <laughs> so that's amazing. Really. You've kind of gone through two big transitions uh, into career wise. Mm. Um, we'll come on to the coaching, but let's go back uh, a little bit and let's talk about Quinns again, because like I said, as a young man to play in that first team and to go on and win the premiership, just talk me through that experience and, and what it was like on that charge and that, you know, heading towards that glory. Yeah. So that, that season was mad. I remember that we, we begun with like, I can't remember what the streak was, but in the kind of double digit win streak from the beginning of the season, and it felt that we were invincible and we were winning games last minute that we should never have won. And yeah, to be, I think I would have been, I think I would have been 20, 122 at that point to be a part of that was amazing and feel so fortunate for that and then yeah the season was great I played a lot and I was really enjoying it and then I had my classic um cyclical I'm going to drop for myself by playing horrendously <laughs> and that happened in the semi-final so I remember I got tap tackled by um Ryan Lamb in the first couple of minutes um when I was through and I, it was one of those proper like sniper rifle tap tackles I wasn't expecting and I landed on the ball and dropped the ball and instantly I was just in this downward spiral and ended up I think I got substituted like 60 minutes because I just I just wasn't I was completely in kind of fight flight freeze mode I had no as I say I have no like cognitive function in my brain I can don't really remember the game and it was just all because of that one mistake that there was no need for it to kind of go down this spiral but because I didn't have didn't have the capacity to cope with stuff like that at that point in my career. And yeah, so I got dropped for the final and had to watch the final from the stands, which was a pretty, it was a really mixed day because it was amazing. But at the same time, I was like, I really wish I was out there. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that, it's funny, that whole, that whole experience of, of winning it is, and it's been, that has been a big part of kind of my journey post-sport is, like you can see at the back here, I've got the medal, this yellow one here on my wall, but that only went up probably 18 months, two years ago, because up until then I didn't feel like I'd, I'd like won the premiership 
even though I'd played a big part in that season. But in my in my brain, I was like, well, you, you didn't play in the final. You don't deserve that. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of mixed emotions looking when I, when I reflect how I was in it. But now looking back on it, I view it as a, yeah, it's like a really positive experience to be part of a team that is the best in the country at something. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, mental side of it, isn't it? In, when you don't play in a final, because I'm going to be honest, I think I would have reacted exactly the same as you. No matter how much I played throughout the season, everybody wants to be in that team on the final day. You know, you mm. want to be out on the pitch, yeah. you know, just nudging it over the line. So it's a very difficult one. And I think, I think maybe as people understand this kind of stuff more, and probably from coaching as well, just the amount of value that people are, are you know, they're told every week what value you're giving by being part of the squad, by being a bench player or any, or any of that, that I think players nowadays probably feel more value than we would have done previously. Yeah, I, I, th- I think so. I think that, that like everyone says it's a team, like it's a team sport and it's the whole, like it is the whole team. There's yes, you, everyone wants to be there in that first 15, but that's not everyone's role in that group. Yeah, not everybody can be, can they? So, so obviously played really well for Quinns for a long time. Tell me about the the switch to Worcester. How did that come about, and was it something that you were really excited about, or how how did it work out? Um, so yeah, it was a it was a switch. I, I had an offer to stay at Quinns, um, but I ended up choosing to go to Worcester. Really, I felt like I wanted. I wanted I felt at the time I felt like I wanted a fresh start and a and a new challenge. But again, like now reflecting kind of from where I am now, I, I really was running away from that kind of cycle of boom bust that I was stuck in. I didn't I didn't know that at the time, but I don't think I had the courage to actually look inside and, and work that out. So I was very much oh well, well I'm at, at a new club with a new coach and new teammates I'll just be able to just magically like click my fingers and start again um but of course I was still there in Worcester <laughs> with the same baggage that I had had at Quinn so yeah it was a good lesson to learn that whatever's going on in your life that kind of moving away is never really the answer it's always it's always better to sort of stay yeah to to be brave enough to do the work and and work out actually what what's going on that maybe you might be running away from. Yeah, interesting. Um, I mean, you sort of talked about quite the negative cycle quite a few times, but you did have a really good strike rate for both of these clubs, right? You scored a lot of tries. Yeah, yeah, I was good at scoring tries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, like, yeah, I, I I had some really good really good r- like runs and spells and. When those were happening, I felt ama- like everything was amazing. It was literally you know, like living you're living your childhood dream of of being involved in a professional team and getting to go out on on the pitch. And for me, that was everything. So, yeah, like whilst maybe focused on the kind of tough parts here, there were loads of incredible moments and memories and friendships and yeah, like stuff that I would never trade in a million years. Who who were some of your uh, sort of closest friends uh, during your your career? Um, so at Worcester, we had a bit of a, a motley crew. It was Niall Annett, Darren O'Shea, Ryan Mills, Ben Howard, Charlie Mulcrone. Just had some weird WhatsApp grief and tended to always go away on holiday with each other whenever we had a break. <laughs> so I've got lots of, yeah, lots of good memories of that. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, cool. Um, now, you mentioned earlier about the injury and retiring, uh, you know, really young. Talk to me about that process. Uh, when it happened, did you sort of see it coming or was it a complete shock? How did it all go go down? Yeah, so I tore, I tore my quad um, against Saris in, like a, in a pre-season match, my second year at uh, Worcester. And then I basically re-tore it another three times after that. And it was a really weird, it was a really weird injury. No one really knew what was going on. It just kept filling with blood. And then they'd have to go get the blood syringe off by the dock. And everyone was kind of a bit puzzled about it. And it happened, that happened the fourth time, about nine months after the original one. Um, and then I had an operation where they tried to, tried to kind of 
stop what was happening. And then when I was rehabbing that, I could only, I only ever got back to 90% of my top speed. So kind of once that was, yeah, once it was clear that I wasn't going to be going past that, that's when I had to make that decision because speed was my thing. And without it, that was kind of, it was, it was a pretty obvious decision what needed to be made. Yeah. Did this kind of, did the length of the injury in terms of how long it was going on for, did that kind of make it a slow ease out or, or was it still like a real shock when the day came that you had to make that decision? Yeah, I think by the time it happened, it wasn't a massive shock to me. Um, every time I retore it, there was a thing in me that was like, this is getting more serious. And that was why I started looking into the coffee business. So I, I actually signed the lease for that in April 2016 with a view to doing it as well as playing. Um, then I retired in June or July that year, um, but I'd already had three months of kind of getting the coffee shop build kind of going. And then I launched that in October, 2016. So I was able to kind of close the rugby door and then go full throttle into coffee. But then that didn't give me the space that I probably needed to grieve the loss of my rugby career and actually process what had happened. I was easily just jumping into the next thing. Interesting use of the word grieve there. And I think it's absolutely correct. You know, when you lose something like that, it is definitely a grieving process, which takes time. Did that then happen kind of after the coffee shop uh, thing that where we were talking earlier? Yeah, exactly. I, that, that process probably really started when I started working with uh, the coach, a guy called Hugh that I mentioned in 2018. So kind of two years after that two years w- would be, I'd say it's just a blur. Like I can't, I can't really remember what happened. Um, and that was my coping mechanism of, of just not feeling the stuff that I wasn't able to feel for sure. Yeah. Um, what do you think now? Like, cause, cause obviously there's still players from your, your generation, mm. your year, you know, still playing at the top level. So when you see people like, uh, I guess Joe Marler is the obvious one, you know, still running out for England. What, what, how, how does that make you feel? What do you think about that? I'm really, I'm like really pleased with people like Joe. Yeah, like we lived together my first year at Quinn's, um, well, first two years actually. But yeah, to, to still be playing for England at this age is, is awesome. And yeah, it's nice. It's nice to see guys I grew up with that I've known since I was 14 still doing what they want to be doing. So yeah, I, I love I love it when I see people like him and the Will Collier that I went to school with, like those kind of guys. It's, it's, really, it's, it's really lovely. Oh, wow. So you live with, with Joe Marler. There must be a couple of stories from that time, I'm sure. Yeah, there's there's a load. Um, but I, yeah, we'll go with this one. I think that this is suitable. Um, just remember there was a there was an afternoon once where we were, four of us were all upstairs uh, watching TV and eating dominoes. And then our academy fitness conditioner rang one of us and was like, I'm outside your house, come downstairs. I'm doing a fridge inspection. <laughs> And we were like, fuck, we <laughs> literally these four massive pizzas. So we had like a little side garage, just all ran downstairs and just chucked these half-eaten pizzas in and hoping that he wasn't going to weirdly go in the garage. But yeah, and then he just did like a fridge inspection whilst we were all kind of like a little bit sweaty because he's a bit scary at the times. But yeah, that was, yeah, one of one of the kind of more low-key, low-key Joe stories. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. Like people actually did, came round and did checks like that. That's um, strict. You know, I don't. I think it was the only time, and it just happened to be the time we were all eating Domino's. So yeah, sure, like, sure, sure. classic. Yeah, it was the only time. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about uh, the coaching now, because as you've sort of alluded to, there's a lot of players, and you know, not limited to just rugby players. Obviously, any sport or, or really any kind of transition in life, who really struggle with that transition piece. So, what is it about that area that really attracted you and made you want to help people in in that? space yeah so i think that there is support for athletes transitioning but i I, my experience my own experience and then my experience of working with my clients is that too much of the focus is on is on what they're going to do so everyone's like well what are you going to do after sport what are you going to do what are you going to do and focusing on jobs and careers and qualifications but that's not taking into consideration the human in this piece and I think that's a huge bit of rugby. I think when you come out of it, you realise that really you were just a commodity, that the clubs view you as a commodity. You're a good that they can get 
value out of and when you're no longer valuable to them you're kind of you let you let go and it's then that kind of part of your life's over and I think this focus on hyper focus on what you're going to do is treating the athletes continually like a commodity so we're going to take off your rugby boots and we're going to put a spreadsheet in your hand like we're we're much more complex we're humans as well as athletes and I'm much more interested in asking the question about who do you want to be after rugby because you can work that out whilst you're still playing you can work out like who Tim is who's not the rugby player I can know I am Sam and this is what I stand for these are my values but I also happen to play rugby but when you start to identify as Sam the rugby player that's when you start to get into sticky water because that's that kind of that whipping out of the rug between beneath your feet is is what can be so discombobulating for people Completely. And obviously I never played anywhere near the level that, that you got to, but I had that same identification. Like I always thought of myself as, as Tim, the rugby player, a hundred percent. And that was definitely a struggle for me when I finished, even as a, you know, a sometimes, you know, part-time athlete towards the end of my career. So how do you help people sort of go through that process? What, what kind of uh, modalities do you use, I guess? So I, I work with people one-to-one -one and it really like it often really does start with working out who they are as a person because when i ask an athlete that question the response is often just a blank face because they've never <laughs> thought about who am i <laughs> because it's so you're such you're in such a high identification like job that it's so easy to just take what's given to you and it's it's reinforced by every time you go to a family get together or a wedding or a, you catch up with people from school, the first question is always how's rugby? And everyone's reinforcing this narrative that that's what's interesting about you. Like if you had had like an art hobby whilst you were playing, no one's going to be asking you at the wedding, like how's your art going? Because no one probably cares, but it's like all these little kind of moments that just reinforce this kind of feeling that this is what's important about me. And if you're not asking yourself the question of what else do I believe is important, then you don't know. So you have to kind of latch on to what's kind of there. So this, the, the first piece, yeah, is working out what, like, what, what do you care about? What, who do you want to be? What do you want to stand for? Because then you can start to like, yeah, get to know yourself. And it sounds so, it sounds so simple and it, and it kind of is because once you have that as a foundation, then once the rugby piece gets taken away, there is a lot more substance left behind. Yeah, just with the players thinking about stuff um, line, is there, you know, with the professional game in particular, everything's done for the players, isn't it? In terms of like, here's your schedule, mm. this is what you need to wear, this is what you need to eat, all yeah. of these kind of things. And again, all of that reinforces not thinking for yourself. So do you think there's any, anything that can be done there within maybe the professional game that will help players, you know, get onto that path earlier? Mm. It's a really good question. Uh, and it's something I've, I've spoken a lot with like ex, like friends who have also finished recently. And um, when I've caught up with them, a lot of them have said, because they've come up fairly recently, a few of them, they're like, I had no idea how institutionalized I was when I was in it. And, and, and it's like something I do with, like probably 75% of the like recently retired athletes, one of the first things we do together is I teach them how to use a Google calendar because often their life is just a complete shit show because they don't know where they're supposed to be or they're forgetting stuff. And there's a lot of shame of many of them around that. They're, they're, they're saying stuff like, I'm 35, I should know how to use a calendar. And I'm like, but it's okay that you don't. <laughs> <laughs> like let's like let's start like there, there's a reason for it right let's start today and and it and it's such an, a small skill but for someone whose well, whole world is kind of in chaos it's it really helpful but yeah I, I don't know in answer to your question what clubs could do differently because it they do need to kind of tell the players where to be and what to dress and because that's kind of nuts and bolts of that of that team so yeah it's yeah, I don't have an answer for that one. <laughs> and 
along the lines of players coming out, obviously you mentioned the, the, the Google Calendar example there, which is, you know, it, it would feel like a tiny little thing, but what other kind of, um, I don't want to say issues, but uh, things that players are going through that have, have recently come out of the game? I think like the, the most common thing I talk about is is the loss of purpose. So one minute, you know exactly why you're getting out of bed in the morning. Like it's, and, and you're really fucking excited about it. And to suddenly lose that is, is really hard. And what I come across a lot is an impatience into believing that they should know what their next purpose or next kind of exciting thing that they want to work on, that like they should know that within a couple of months of retiring. So there's almost like an expectation of like, well, I've had it once, I need it again quickly. And there's a, and, and it, to, to me, it's it needs to be the opposite. If you're going to search, like everyone talks about finding purpose and as if it's like a, an object and it, or a thing. And I don't believe it is. I believe like purpose is just something you feel. So when you're in like living your purpose, it, you, it brings about a feeling of excitement and nervousness and a bit of trepidation and fear, but also, yeah, they're kind of pretty much kind of butterflies when you start to work on something that, that feels really exciting. But if it's something that you feel and it's not an object, then you can't actively search for it. So you almost need to try less hard, <laughs> which for an athlete who is so used to trying really, really hard and seeing instant results they know that if i go to the gym an extra time this week and every week uh, an extra day every week for next month i'll be stronger and this next kind of chapter in their life is a little bit more i guess complex and nuanced than that it's, it's not so much kind of the input i put in is the input i get out it's there's a lot more kind of going on yeah um and you kind of mentioned or alluded to at least an almost like an impatience to find the next thing um, where, as you know, quite often it will take some time before that thing appears in front of you. And I certainly, like I've changed career a number of times throughout my life and I've, I've done lots of different things, including what I'm doing now. And just as an example, you know, doing this podcast, you know, lining up to have a chat with you today gives, does give me that feeling, you know, that sort of excitement and, uh, um, yeah, almost like a little nervousness feel. So mm. back to the players that you're trying to help, though, is there an understanding that, you know, A, the thing they find next might be the, not be the thing forever or um, and, and about how long it might take to find it in any case? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think a lot of, there's a lot of pressure for the first job or the first thing to be the, the, the final piece of the jigsaw. And as you've alluded to, like, you've been on a journey through lots of careers and some of them you probably love, some of them probably not so much. And, but they've all kind of, they've geared you up and given you the skills to be able to do what you do today. And today you're telling me that you're ringing from Colombia because you live very nomadically. And like, I'm sat here going, that sounds pretty fucking cool. But your life's not always been like that. And it's the same with me, like coffee, the coffee business wasn't what I was born to do. It was fun. There were bits of it I loved, but there were bits of it that were really hard, but it's given me an amazing skill set and understanding to step into what I do now. And I do believe I'm now living or working in, a, in, in my purpose or however you want to put that. And I think that with the athletes coming out of the game, it's, it's, it's try lots, have loads and loads and loads of conversations with people because your next job offer or investor or business partner or idea or friendship, it will come from a conversation. It will come from having a relationship with someone. So like those are really proactive steps that you can start taking prior to retiring is rather than focusing on like becoming X is I'm just going to speak to loads of people because it's going to be those people that are going to serve you and they're going to help you and they're going to want to help you if you've built kind of the actual kind of meaningful relationships with them. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. I think that would probably be quite a nice way to finish this section, but before we move on to the stash section and the end of the show, is there sort of any other sort of thoughts you want to share or anything to sort of round up? I think to, to kind of finish on that is just for any one, whether they're an athlete or, or a non-athlete in transition where life feels really scary and uncertain and like you're having to let go of the thing you know and the thing that's safe 
is just just want to kind of say that like the next chapter can be bigger than the current chapter right the next chapter can feel better than the current chapter the next chapter can really be something really exciting and special but if you if you're willing to make the choice for it to be that way because i remember when i retired i literally the narrative in my head was life will never be as good as it is now like how could anything ever top running out at twickenham or wembley or scoring a truck like that was my narrative and when you believe that of course nothing will ever be better than what you're doing now but if you can shift that narrative to i'm going to create the next chapter to be bigger than what i'm in now then all of a sudden you're living in a world where anything's possible and yeah that's kind of what i'd want to leave anyone listening that is in that kind of dark scary place to know that there is hope there is light at the end of the tunnel to use one of the most overused um sayings in the world <laughs> oh, no beautiful words mate i think that's um, a really really strong message so thank you for that okay let's move on to the stash section where we talk about all the kit and i can see you got some on your wall behind you there but what is your what is your most favorite piece of stash that you've ever received um I think, and this is this shows my ego at play when I was a teenager. I think the most my most favourite bit of kit I ever received was like I think as England or eighteens we got this bright red orange waterproof um, Nike England um, jacket or uh, pullover jacket thing for training in, and I just remember wearing it every training session at school. <laughs> like, just to make sure that everyone knew I played for England. And that's 100% <laughs> highlighting my ego at that time. <laughs> I think I remember the ones you're talking about. They were a flashy bit of kit as well, weren't they? They were, lo they were lovely, yeah. Very waterproof, <laughs> very comfortable and very flashy. It was perfect for a 17-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. What is your favourite kit of all time? So this can be any team from any era. Um... I actually think I remember it was after I left Quinn's. I remember their first Adidas kit. Um, and just remembering thinking like, I wish I was still playing just to get all of that stash. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. I like it. I mean, the Quinn's kit is iconic. So um, when Adidas get yeah. involved in that, it's only going to be good. And what about awful kits? Any kits that you really dislike at the moment that you'd rather burn than wear? Um... I remember for my last year, so when I was an upper sixth at school, me and a couple of the guys like spent hours putting this kit together, designing it, um, getting sponsors for it. And we were really proud of all of this effort. And then it turned up and it was the most cheap polyester shit that I'd ever seen. <laughs> and everyone just absolutely ripped us for it. <laughs> and we'd been so excited. And then it just literally like a lead balloon landed in, <laughs> landed in the school. <laughs> So yeah, oh, that was probably the worst. I wouldn't want I to burn it though, because it would 100% poison us with all the plastic. <laughs> I can't, I, well, I can imagine the crushing disappointment. I've, I've been involved in organising kits before in the past and like that level of excitement, the fact that you've got your own little mark yeah. on it, it's your stuff, and then... <laughs> yeah, it's not good. Not good. <laughs> Okay, mate, as we bring this to, this to a close, if people want to get a hold of you to talk about uh, any of the amazing coaching that you're doing or any other reason for that matter, um, what, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, just, um, just on LinkedIn. So everything I do is on there. You can um, search Sam Smith Coaching and I'll come up on, on there. And yeah, you can DM me if you have any questions or yeah, want to talk anything through. Okay, amazing. I will link all that up in the show notes below for everybody. And you can also find it at amateurrugbypodcast.com. So it just leaves me to say, Sam, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a really fun and interesting and deep conversation as well. I've really enjoyed it. No, thanks so much, Tim. It's been, yeah, really lovely to connect after all this time as well. Good man. Okay. There he goes, Sam Smith. What a great chat that was. You know, I just remember him as being such a, a lovely young lad when we played together, and that's clearly transitioned into a, a, a great man now. 
Um, really interesting with all the coaching stuff. I know a lot of players really struggle with that. We've had Jeff Griffiths on the pod previously talking about some things that he's doing for it too. And it's a really important space. So go and check out Sam's work, see what he's doing, follow him on LinkedIn at the very least. And um, hopefully you'll be able to get some benefit from that too. Okay, during the Great Rugger Run, I visited a ton of rugby clubs across three years, over 300, I think. And a common theme amongst them was that a lot of clubs really struggle with their social media. So I'm, I'm thinking about trying to do something to help. If you're in that situation, if you've got a club where you think we could use some help with our social media, or some guidance or anything like that, then let me know. Um, go to amateurrugbypodcast.com forward slash social send me your email, send me a little message, and I'm just trying to garner whether there's any interest in this across rugby clubs, wherever you are, anywhere around the world. Um, So we'll finish up now. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can do all the social media stuff, like, comment, subscribe, all of that jazz. But what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. And until then, get out and play.